Hey, well, if you're a guest with us this morning, it is good to see you. Welcome here to Citizens. Um, we are glad that you are joining us. And um, yeah, it's good to have a full house. I think we're almost full. So <laughs> it's a good problem to have, right? If you have a Bible, please turn to Hebrews chapter 10. This series, actually when we uh, got into this Hebrew series, the whole idea behind it was that we would be together thinking about what it means to, to persevere. Because it's hard to finish well, right? I don't know if you've had that before we started something. I mean, how many New Year's resolutions have ended after two weeks? Or how many projects have just um, fizzled out really quickly? I can remember one, it was a number of years ago, where I, I found this old, I don't know if it was an antique desk, but it was like an old desk but it was painted green, okay, like terrible green, forest green. So I thought, this is okay. I can salvage this. Brought it into the garage and bought like paint stripper, right? Started lathering that on there and started scraping it off. Well, under the green paint, there was actually orange paint. And then under that, there was another color. I can't even remember now. And then under that, there was varnish, okay? And I thought, okay, I can handle this. More paint stripper, right? Just putting it on, lathering it on scraping it some more, and then along the edges of the desk, it was kind of like um, like a vine kind of, you know, so it was all like rigid, and so I was like, oh my goodness, this is getting really bad now, because to try to scrape four layers of whatever was down there on this thing, and not too long after that, the desk was in the garbage heap, okay, it just went out, I'm, like, I'm not sticking with this project, I wasn't going to persevere right to the end of a beautiful wooden desk sitting in my room. Perseverance can be tough. And I was thinking of this passage today in James, um, actually this week, James 1 verse 4, it says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. James is like, I don't know if begging is the right word, but he's, he's pleading with his audience to just let it do its work. Hang in there to the end. That the things that God is doing in, in your life and in my life, those things are not by accident. They're not um, purposeless. They are there for a reason. If we, if we allow them to do their work, the fruit that it will bear um, will be something that obviously God will glorify in. But we will also discover that along the way, he has things to teach us. He has ways to mold us into the image of his son. So the question is, what do we need to persevere through? For most of us, probably the top thing that comes to our mind is the pandemic. But many of us are sick of talking about the pandemic already. So maybe there's something else even, right? That something God is doing in your life. And he's calling you maybe to just hang in there. Persevere. Because the fruit that is coming will be born in time. Why don't we, before we get into our text here in Hebrews 10, why don't we just uh, open in a word of prayer. Lord, we do ask you to um, just open our eyes to the truths that we're about to look at. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would clarify even my own thoughts. And Lord, as they're expressed here, that... Um, the Holy Spirit would make those land exactly where they need to. Lord, we are so thankful that you are faithful and that you are good and that your grace is sufficient for all things. And so we just pray, Father, that you would speak to us this morning and that your Son would be glorified in our midst. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 10, we're starting in verse 19. And in, in verse 19, you can see the first word in, in your Bible will probably be therefore. Okay, that's the first thing that you're going to see is because th at this point, the author is taking a turn in the text. Okay, so he's been building for nine chapters. He's been explaining why Christ is so much better than the old covenants, better than the sacrificial system. He's better than the high priestly system. Every, every week, you probably heard this, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And now he's, he's turning. He's saying, therefore, because of everything that he's explained beforehand, he's saying, now here's how you should live. Okay, so he's getting actually really practical with us. 
And for the, next, for the rest of the book, basically, he says, this is how you're to live, and this is how believers in the past have lived out the realities of the truths that he's been covering. All right, so he's taken a turn here, and he's wanting us to see that there's actually a, there's actually a response now with your life to the truth and the reality that we've been learning in Hebrews. And he starts by verse 19 through 22. He starts by talking about this idea of living with confidence. Okay, let's listen to these verses again. It says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Here the author is saying, man, you can live now in complete confidence. Not because of, you know, the things that you can do or because of, you know, who you are necessarily and all that comes with you, but the confidence that comes with knowing we have an open relationship with Jesus. So when we look at the life of Christ, and, and I think we talked about this last week, when Satan was hoping that you know, he would crucify and kill Christ, and that would be the end of it, right? That was what Satan was hoping for, and all the religious leaders, and even you know, people looking at it at the scene during the, during the time, they would have been like, man, what? This guy's God? Like, you know, the soldiers were mocking him. And yet in that moment, we know that God was doing actually the greatest work. And after Christ died, there's some crazy things that happened. It, it says in, in Matthew chapter 27, it says that like rocks split open. This is right after Christ died. Rocks split open, tombs opened, and saints were raised from the dead. I mean, can you imagine being in Jerusalem? There's like suddenly someone who was dead is like walking around now. Okay, there's some wild things that were happening but one of the things it also says, and you'll remember this if you were ever in Sunday school or something, is the, the veil was torn, right? The veil in the temple that separated the, the outer area from the Holy of Holies, this four-inch thick veil torn from top to bottom. And this is meant to like visually show believers that what Christ did now opened the door to a new kind of relationship with God. So that area that was reserved for the holiness of God and for the high priest to only go into once a year was now open. And through the sacrifice of Christ, the believer now has access into this holy of holy places. Talk about confidence, right? A new kind of relationship with the with the God of the universe, one that is without restriction, one that this word actually here means to, to approach, means to, the verb implies a continuous or repeat, repeated approaching. Just like regular over and over, not like the high priest that's once a year, you know, not like nervously going in. Now it's like open, full assurance, full confidence, not because of the things that we've done, but because of Christ's Sacrifice. Remember, these are, these are things that we are called to live out as a result of what Christ has done for us. And so we stand now as believers with confidence. Confidence. Not in, not in a confidence like that the world will give you. The world says, man, if you um, have your job or maybe you have a beautiful home or an apartment, wherever it is that you have to live, or maybe you have like a nice car, or I think if you're here in Elmira, it's like a nice truck, right? If you have a nice truck, okay, you get like confidence to live because you're like, I've made it. I have what I need, okay? And you can go around the world, and the same kind of story is sold everywhere, right? So I've been in Zambia, and people are wanting maybe, maybe not a truck, okay? But maybe they're wanting like a car, or they want like a radio, or maybe they're wanting like a home that's beautiful to them. Or you can go to like London, England. Or you can go to Japan. I mean, wherever you go, people are searching for this, this tangible thing or these things that are going to give you a confidence that you can stand on. And this is saying you can have all those things, but this gives you confidence that is beyond just like earth, the earthly realm. This is a transcendent 
confidence. One that allows you to enter into the place of the Holy of Holies, the place of God. There's a story of this um, early church father, Chrysostom is his name, and he lived actually in the 300s, so just a few generations after when the New Testament was written. And he was known for like fiery preaching and just like saying it, like telling it like it is. And so at his, um, you know, the Roman people didn't really take to that really well, and the Roman authorities didn't take to that really well. And so he was brought into court because they were going to Um, put some sort of judgment on him, either banish him, you know, send him away to an island, which was pretty common for the Roman courts to do. Now, this wasn't like go to like a beautiful hotel island, okay? This is more like, you know, Tom Hanks kind of castaway island, right? It's like you're going to go there and maybe you're going to starve to death. That was the idea. And so this was recorded as a little dialogue that he had with the emperor. And it goes like this. It says, you, he says, you cannot banish me For this world is my father's house. But I will slay you, said the emperor. No, you cannot, said the noble champion of the faith. For my life is hid with Christ in God. I will take away your treasures. No, but you cannot, for my treasure is in heaven and my heart is there. But I will drive you away from man and you shall have no friend left. No, you cannot, for I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. I defy you. For there is nothing you can do to hurt me. There is nothing you can do to hurt me. That's a confidence in not the stuff that the person could take away from him. That the state, like the state could take anything away from him. He's like, you can send me wherever you want. You can take everything. You can't take away the thing that's most precious to me. The confident relationship that I have with Christ So we're called to stand in confidence, but not to stand in arrogance, all right? And there's there's a fine line sometimes where we can stand in confidence, and that confidence suddenly shifts to arrogance where the focus is not on what God has done. The focus somehow slants to me, okay? And we've probably even seen it in our own day and age here today, right? Where it's like, I'm a Christian, I deserve X, or I'm a Christian and I deserve X. Why? Whatever, fill in the blank for whatever you've seen or maybe even whatever you've felt. So this is not a call to confident arrogance, like, ha, now I'm a Christian. You know, nobody can tell me what to do. I'm free, whatever. This is like, I have confidence in my relationship with God and being able to come to God freely. So this says here, look what it says. Um, Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That that word assurance also can mean genuine or authentic. All right? Genuine or authentic. Now, probably our modern understanding of authentic is more like, this is who I am, This this is who I think I am, this is who I believe me to be, and so this is my true authentic self, accept me for who I am. That's that's not what this is saying, okay? This is saying God is at the center of the universe, and you can come to him. Remember that old song, Just As I Am, right? That was an old, like, Billy Graham song. He used to end all of his messages with that. It was like, you can come to God totally as you are in your fully authentic self, knowing that you don't um, get everything right. We make mistakes. We hurt people at times. We make mistakes like in small ways and we make some mistake in some really big ways, right? If we're truly honest, we make some really big mistakes. And God says, I can handle that. The blood of Christ has covered that. You can freely come as you are into my presence. And that should be a liberating and a freeing truth for us that we don't have to sanitize ourselves, we don't have to like ignore some things about us, but that God can actually handle everything about us, every aspect about us, and that the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ covers everything. So we go into his presence with total confidence. Second one here, the second calling for us in this little section is in verse 23. So we can draw near, and now in verse 23 he says, So let us hold fast the confession of our hope 
without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. So let us hold fast. My, my text here says without wavering, but some may say unswervingly. Not really a word that we use anymore, but like unswerving. Think of swerving, okay? Maybe you've done that before by accident, or maybe you've like tried to do it, right? You've wanted to swerve. Maybe, you know, you're swinging the steering wheel over to one side and you're swinging it over to the other side. You're hoping to like fishtail or do donuts or whatever. I don't know if you've, I, I don't do those things, but I'm sure some of you have, okay? Maybe on a snowy, actually I've seen it in the old Woodside parking lot. It's a great parking lot for that, right? Um, swerving around. This is saying, hold on to the truths in a unswerving way, Okay? Hang on to them. He calls them here the, the confession of our hope. These are like the truths of the gospel, the reality of the scriptures, the reality about Jesus, the reality about his sacrifice on the cross. Those truths, hang on to them. Hold on to them. This is like an active thing that we actually do is we hold on to them. We put our trust and our hope in them. But I think the, the key word in this Verse is actually right in the middle. It says, for. All right? For. If you underline in your Bible, that's a great word to underline. Because it says, for he who promised is faithful. Man, we hang on to the truth. This is an active thing that we do. But the key driver is that this is actually, it's based on God. Right? I hang on. But my hanging on is not actually accomplishing the hope that I need. The hope and the reality, the truth behind my hanging on is actually that God is going to do it. That God is the one who's faithful. That he was faithful to the end. So I hold fast onto that truth. Holding fast onto that. Whether that's reading scripture or um, being with other believers and talking about these things. This is like an active holding on to the reality of the gospel with a confidence that God is the one who's actually at work here. And, and I, I think if, if you're a believer, part of the, the journey of your maturing in your faith and your growing in your faith is a ever-growing understanding and reality of who God is. So as God gets bigger in your understanding and in the reality of your life, you realize, man, I'm holding on to a big God, a God who can conquer things that, man, are way beyond me. So we hold fast. And then third, verse 24 and verse 25, we gather together. So it says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So here he says, part of the... Part of the design of God for the believer is that we would actually gather together as his people. That we would be together in presence. And so the Bible actually here tells us, it says, let us consider. Like it's actually trying to get us to think about how to do this well. Okay, And, and we live in this, obviously we're living in a season where it's very unique. You know, this happens Hopefully once a century, okay? Hopefully this is the last one we see. But the, the general calling of, of the Word of God and of the Bible and specifically of this text is for believers to regularly be together. Because listen, the Bible was written in, in the context of reality, okay? The Bible was written to real people who had real challenges. And so it says, let us consider how to do this because they knew even back when this was written that, man, it's tough to get together. Like, life is busy. We're not the only generation who have had a busy life, okay? We're not the only generation who has struggled with like, getting together. It says, think of ways, consider, think about how are you actually going to get together? How are you going to gather as God's people? And so even us as a church, as Citizens Church, those of us, you know, those of you who have called this home for the last almost year already, right, been together, we know that we have We've like thought about how do we actually want to do this gathering together. So we do Sunday mornings where we worship and we, we glorify God together. And we have missional families where we get together and we want to like get to know one another and build that body of 
faith together in these small communities. And hopefully in the coming months, we're going to talk about sacred communities where we get together in even smaller groupings where like real discipleship and um, conversations around like the true realities of what's going on in our hearts can happen. We, we don't talk about those things um, with any kind of shame or any kind of like, oh, is this too strategic? No, we're like, we're called to consider how to do this. We're called to think about how we're actually going to make disciples together. And so we're doing that as a church. And so the calling here is to get together. And it seems like in, in the text here that it was starting to um, get to be a habit for some people. You can see that in verse 25. There was a habit growing in some people where they weren't actually doing that. Either it was the pressure of persecution or maybe it was um, just, you know, struggling to kind of really put both feet into to the church and what was happening. And so here he's saying, man, don't fall into that trap of not meeting with other believers, okay? So I grew up in church in the 80s. Who was in church in the 80s here? Yeah, there's a, there a few, okay? <laughs> okay, back then, or at least where I grew up, I don't know if that was the case here, but it was like church was, there was like about three times a week where you were going to be in church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and probably Wednesday night or something like that. Maybe an extra if you were like in the choir. That was, you were like top notch, okay? Extra choir night. But it was like, those were the designated times and it was a, I don't, is it, it was a strong expectation that you were going to be at all those places, right? That was kind of the view. And then come like the 90s and, and maybe early 2000s, again, and I wasn't in the region here. I'm just talking about my experience. Kind of shifted away from that, right? The Sunday night kind of died. The, and the, the midweek maybe shifted to a small group if your church was into that. But it was just a total shift away. So in each time period, like things move and shift. And now we live in an age with the podcast, with, you know, video church is going to be like this massive thing in the future. And so the opportunity to not gather together has taken a different form, right? It's changed again. And so if these guys were struggling with the habit of it, and there were some sort of circumstances that moved them in that way, we also have the opportunity to come or to not to come, to participate in what, you know, your local church is doing or not to participate. We also live in this age of, like, extreme freedom, okay? So, like, the amount of, of things that you could choose to do, and, and we're coming to, to summertime, right? So it might be going to a cottage. It might be going on vacation. Whatever it is, the amount of freedom that we have is just, like, massive, and so where does, like, going to a local church kind of land on that? If your list is, like, 1 to 100. Please don't say the answer, okay? But if your list is 1 to 100, where does it land on that, okay? The only reason I'm bringing that up is because it's the same issue that they were facing here in this church. Same kind of circumstances. Maybe different in some ways. First century Rome, different from today, but same sort of scenario. And they were faced with this question of like, man, should we gather? And the, the, the pastor, the writer here is saying, don't forget to gather together. It is what you were made to, to be as a believers with one another. And we're experiencing even the fruit of that now after having kind of been weaned from it during this whole pandemic time. So the calling is to let us draw near, to let us hold fast, and to let us consider and then he goes in verse 26, and we didn't read those verses yet, and I'm just going to read a couple of them, but he goes into this warning, okay? There's five warnings. Remember, we've, we've looked at three of them already. This is warning number four, and these are the verses that, again, when you read them, man, they can make some people um, uncomfortable, all right? So let's just read a couple of these verses. Verse 26 says this, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire will consume the adversaries. And then he goes on right to verse 31, okay, kind of talking about the, this idea of the judgment of God. And so, like, what is going on in these verses? 
is, is the writer here saying that we can lose our salvation? Is he saying that if I don't do all these right things that I'm going to be, what do he say, like I'm going to be in this fury of fire? What is going on here? Just as like quick kind of side note, as just to the nature of salvation, okay? Now, you could take multiple messages that just describe salvation itself, but what does it mean even to be saved? How are we saved by God? Well, the first thing to know is that salvation is a work of God, okay? Salvation is something that only God can do. You can't look back and say, man, I you know, I was like really good, or I read like three books on apologetics, or I asked all the right questions, or I, you know, figured it out. Nobody's going to be able to look back and say, I figured it out. I got the right answers. That's how I got saved. Salvation is a work of God. Look at John chapter 1, when John is like describing Christ, and then he goes on to describe what... Um, believers, you know, the relationship that they have with him. It says this in John 1, 13, it says, talking about those who are born again, you who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's God that does all the work, right? So that, as Ephesians say, says, we can't boast in anything. There's nothing that we can boast in that we had any part to play in this, okay? That God somehow like leaned on us, to make this happen. So salvation is completely a work of God. Now, if you've read, um, you know, books on theology, you'll know that there's, there's a lot of different takes on this, okay? So there's like Calvinism, which would say that, you know, salvation is... Siri was wondering about Calvinism, okay? So Calvinism is is this idea that God knows everything that's going to happen, even a Siri call, okay? God knows all things, and it's actually God that is orchestrating all things. So Calvinism would say that the, belief, the person is dead, and it is God that completely raises them to life, and they alone do it, okay? On the other side, you've got Arminianism, which is that man has a part to play. Man actually makes a choice, so much so if you take like Arminianism to its kind of total all the way down the road, it's like God doesn't even know what the future is because our choice is going to dictate the future, okay? Now, systematic theology likes to put it in nice, clean chapters, okay? They like to have a chapter on Calvinism and a chapter on Arminianism, and I think it's a little bit of both, honestly, okay, when we look at Scripture. It is that, yes, God is, like I said, God is 100% the one who saves, but God actually allows us, out of love, the ability to trust in him, now, that trusting in him is not a work. That is not something we point to and we're like, I trusted. Yes, I did a work. I had some part in this. It is totally God. But all we do is we trust in him. Look at the verse before John 13, John 1, 13. John 1, 12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. And to everyone who, when they were confronted by the gospel and they believed in him, it was God that actually saved them. But our belief is actually a part of the process, okay? But not enough that it's like a work that we've done. So we can say like the Apostle Paul, it is by grace alone. It is a grace that only God has done. And that work, that work of salvation, I got a few more verses here, is a work that gives us security. Look at John chapter 5, verse 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Okay, that's what happens when we become a believer. You pass from death to life. There is security. Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is this down payment, this guarantee that our salvation is secure. Secure. We rest in that. So, again, what is this text saying? Well, here's two things that it's not saying, okay? And I think these are really important. 
Obviously, otherwise I wouldn't have included them in the message, okay? But the first one is this, that you do not have to be perfect, okay? You do not have to have perfect faith. So I remember when, when we lived in West Africa, it was a Muslim country that we were working in, and we actually went, or at least I think I was at a, a ceremony where this older Muslim man did this big ceremony, made big old sacrifice, and the sacrifice was that for the rest of his life, he would be completely sinless, okay? So he would do no more sinning from that day forward. Everybody eat the meal, good times ahead. Christianity never says that. Christianity never gives that assurance that you will come to a point someday when you're 70, when you're 80, when you're 35, I don't know what the year would be. There is never going to be a day where you are perfect. We are all in this journey of becoming like Christ and we need the grace of God every day, amen? And so there's no day of perfection. There is no day where we will ever be perfect. And so this is not saying that we are needing to be perfect It's also not saying that you cannot have doubts or raise questions, okay? Some people read this text and and all this language, you're like, man, I feel like I should never ask a question. I feel like I should never have a doubt. The Word of God is actually very comfortable with people having questions, okay? It's very comfortable with believers living in this turmoil of doubt even. Look at Matthew 28, right at the end here, this is the Great Commission, It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. All right, these are the disciples. These are like, these are the guys. This is what the future plan is landing on. They doubted. And look at verse 18 there. It says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. Yes, you're doubting, but guess what? You have authority. Go out. Do the work that you're called to do, even with the doubts that you're hanging on to. Jude chapter 1, verse 22, in this beautiful little, like, one-page little book, it says, and have mercy on those who doubt. And it's a letter to believers. It's a letter to a church, okay? So it's actually the pastoral word there is saying, if you have people that doubt in your midst, like all of us, or 99% of us, those doubts are not to be pushed down to the side or those people who have those questions to be relegated or to be, you know, demeaned in any way. Have mercy on them. They should be welcome in your midst because we're not called to be without doubts. So what is the text saying here? What is he driving at? And we'll close with this. I think he's saying two things. The first is he's saying, don't just watch, okay? Don't just watch. It seems that in this church, there were people, there were um, maybe uh, spouses or maybe people that were just attending that were just there, okay? They were just attending and they, it says that they were hearing, they were receiving, look at verse 26, they were receiving the knowledge of the truth. So they were like enjoying the benefits of church. They were just enjoying being around other Christians. And yet they had not fully put their trust in Christ. Okay? So let's, let's be clear here. We don't, we're not saved by attending Citizens Church. We're not saved by growing up in a Christian family. We're not saved by like joining Uh, a serve team here at a church. Those things do not save us. You can do all those things and still not know God as your personal Savior. You can spend a whole lifetime in a church and still not have actually put your trust and your hope in Jesus. And so the author here is saying, don't let that happen. Don't be caught watching. Especially don't be caught in a church just watching. He's saying now is the time for you to believe because He says, the judgment actually is coming. And so he talks about the judgment that is going to come. And now, listen, most of us like to, we like to think about Jesus as, you know, the one who walked around in the first century and he multiplied bread and he's like holding kids. And every picture we see of Jesus, he's like just, um, you just want to be with him and close to him. And that is a real image of who Jesus was. But there's also an image of Jesus in the Bible of judgment, 
of one who's going to actually make right everything that is wrong. And I was just reading this week in, in Revelation, and it talked about Jesus who's like riding a horse, and he's wearing this robe. It's like dripping with blood. Like read the description of it. Go back and read it. Read Revelation. It's kind of wild, right? But it's, it is not the view that you get in the Gospels. It is a, it's a picture of Jesus who wants to make right everything that is wrong. And so the author here is saying, man, don't just watch. Believe today. But then also I think the last thing is that it's a word for those of us who are believers. And, and it's to believe in better promises. Okay? So he says, don't, don't, don't leave these truths behind, but believe in the better promises. And the reason that he's saying that is, Verses 32 to 36. And I just want to read these verses out just to, to grasp what, what he's asking them to hang on to because it's something that they were holding on to before. Verse 32 says this, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened. So, like, think about the time when you first heard about Jesus and put your trust in him. You endured hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those who were so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison and joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Did you, did you catch what he's saying there? You joyfully accepted the plundering of property. Like, how many of us would think that maybe they've, like, lost it? You know, like, they're maybe a little bit cuckoo now because they're actually taking joy when someone is taking something in a wrong way from them. Our natural inclination would be like, fight this, man. Fight for your right. That is your house. That is your thing. Do not let them take it. And yet they were joyfully accepting it. Why? Why did they joyfully accept it? Because they knew that there was a better possession and one that was abiding. They knew that getting Christ was better than even having the things of this world. To have them taken was nothing. And so he's saying, don't let that go. Believe in these better promises. And I can remember, um, actually, the, the, one of a funeral that I did a number of years ago, it was of this uh, older lady who, whenever uh, we'd see her, she was just like, she would say, man, I'm just ready to go home to Jesus. You know, I'm just, she's kind of like, I'm done. You know, she was, ma she was basically blind. And, um, you know, you might think that, oh, she's just like tired of living or she just wants to, you know, tired of paying her taxes or, you know, I don't know what, she's just tired of those things. And that could be the truth. But the reality was when we talked to her is that she she came to realize that the promises of eternity and the promises with Jesus were better than the things in this planet. Like the things that we have here, they just wear out. And her body was wearing out. And so for her, the, the promises were bigger. Now, for those of, us, those of us who are younger, we're not thinking that way. We're thinking, eh, feeling pretty good here, actually. <laughs> you know, I want to hang on to my stuff. So, how do we actually get the promises to grow bigger than the things around us? And the reminder for us today is to believe in the provision of Christ and to put our trust in the gospel because he and his work is the only thing that's actually going to sustain us to the end. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these um, encouraging and challenging texts, Lord. Um, we thank you for the provision of Christ. Lord, I pray for, for anyone who hasn't put their trust in you, Lord. May today be the day. And Lord, for those of us who are half-hearted in our trust of you, Lord, may again today, may we um, be reminded of what you've done for us and that we don't do the things that we do to be accepted by you, but we trust in the provision of Christ for all things. So, Lord, we just pray that that would become a reality in our hearts uh, today and, and even in the coming weeks. And we know that it's only a work of your spirit in that, in, 
and deep down in our hearts, Lord. And so we just ask that you would do that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.